Welcome to the final segment of this week. In this segment, we discuss the principle behind prediction in image processing. It's a way to capture the correlation amongst image and video pixels, and it is utilized widely in many signal processing applications. In the context of compression, we'll utilize prediction in many places these three weeks. The idea is to encode and transmit to the decoder the unpredictable part in the prediction process, which is the prediction error. Then the decoder, with knowledge of the prediction model, performs the same prediction as the encoder and adds the transmitted prediction error to form the reconstructed signal. For lossless compression, the prediction error is encoded error-free, while for lossy compression, it is first quantized and then encoded, as we'll see in the next two weeks. Based on this principle, there are various lossless image compression schemes, such as Kalik and JPEG-LS. We'll discuss briefly JPEG-LS, and of course we'll talk more about the lossy version of JPEG next week. So let's proceed then with this final segment of week eight. Prediction is used extensively in signal processing and certainly in compression, the topic of this and the next two weeks lectures. So based on a prediction model, we can predict the signal value at a given pixel using values from the past. That is values that have been processed and we therefore know their values. The past refers to spatial or temporal or spatio-temporal past, and of course it also relates to the direction the image is processed, that is left to right and top down. So as an example, here's an image, so in predicting the value of the pixel here, if I use these neighbors and assuming a left to right and a top down scanning direction, then the O's here, these neighbors refer to the past of the pixel at X. These are values that I have already computed. The prediction model can be the result of an optimization problem, such as minimizing the prediction error, as we'll see next week, or it can result from heuristics and extensive experimentation. Of course, every time we do a prediction, we are bound to make an error, sometimes a small one and other times a large one. And therefore, the reconstructed value equals the predicted value plus the prediction error. Now, in compression, as mentioned earlier, we code and send to the decoder the prediction error. This is the unpredictable part, or the correction term. Since the decoder can carry out the prediction, assuming that this model is is available to the decoder, only this prediction error term is needed to form the reconstruction. When we deal with lossless compression, this correction part here, the, correction, the prediction error, needs to be encoded error-free using some of the techniques we covered so far, that is Huffman and arithmetic coding. As we'll see when we discuss lossy compression next week, this prediction error is first quantized before being encoded. An algorithm for lossless image compression based on a heuristic prediction model is Kalik, Context Adaptive Lossless Image Compression. Also JPEG, the Joint Photographic Experts Group, has produced lossless image compression standards under, that's what the LS stands for. We will discuss lossy JPEG next week. This is probably what most people are familiar with but I will briefly here discuss a version of JPEG-LS. But before we proceed, let's look at the question of why encoding the prediction error versus the original values saves us bits. We will show an example here with a simple prediction model and try to argue why it is more efficient to encode the prediction error than the original signal. So we're going to work with this image and we're going to use a one-dimensional prediction model. So each line of this image is going to be processed um, separately. So let's assume that here is how one of these lines in the image looks like. Nothing particular about the values here.
So the prediction model is that the predicted value at n equals the value of the signal at n minus 1. So if this if we assume this is n, this is n minus 1, therefore this is x n minus 1, this is x of n. According to this prediction model, the predicted value at n is equal to x of n minus 1. And therefore, the error that results is just x of n minus the predicted value, so the value here. So if we apply this model to this image, here is how the error looks like. Since the original image is an 8-bit image, has 256 values, the error has twice the dynamic range. Therefore, the values range from 2 minus 255 to plus 255. And for displaying purposes, we have linearly mapped this range to the 0 to 255 range. Therefore, the value here in the middle of 127 represents 0. So as expected, there are a lot of 127s, a lot of zeros in the error image, because this model is quite accurate in the flat regions of the image. However, it fails, or the prediction error is large, at the edges of the image. And this is what you see here. If you have a close look, it really acts as an edge detector in some sense. Large values are you know, close to 255 and close to 0 are observed at the edges of the image. So it is this prediction error, this image that is sent to the decoder instead of the original one. In trying to see why it is more efficient to encode the prediction error than the original one, let's look at the histogram of these two images. So here is the histogram of the original image. If you recall, actually, this was an image that we used uh, when we covered enhancement to demonstrate histogram equalization. So this is the histogram, which is the close to an equalized histogram and, and was the result of the histogram equalization algorithm. Now, if we look at the histogram of the error, as expected, it's pointed, pointed around 0. And 0, again, is represented by the value 127. If we look at the entropy of the original image, let's call it H1, and the entropy of the error image, call it H2. If you recall from our discussion, the entropy of a discrete source is maximized when the symbols emitted by the source are equally probable, or in other words, the histogram is flat. So based on this, H1 is greater than H2. And assuming that I have a means to achieve entropy, I have an arithmetic coder, for example, that can come close to entropy, then based on this, I need more bits to encode the original image than the resulting prediction error. We look at the first version of the JPEG lossless standard. There are eight predictors used, and they're given by these expressions. So predictor zero, is where no prediction is taking place, so the actual values are encoded. Then there are three one-dimensional predictors and four two-dimensional predictors. So if we look at some of them as an example, so let's look, for example, at predictor number one. Then the predicted value at this location, ij, equals the value of the pixel to the left. This is exactly the one-dimensional predictor we used in the previous example to find the error and argue about uh, the reasons for encoding the error. If we look at predictor number six, then the pixel value at this location is equal to the pixel value at, on the left with weight one, the one above with weight a half, and the one diagonally above with weight minus a half. So this is also a linear predictor, a two-dimensional one that uses the three neighbors as shown here. So the prediction error clearly is the actual value of the image at location ij minus the predicted value 
location ij. So for lossless compression, this error is encoded losslessly, and for JPEG LS, it's encoded using adaptive arithmetic coding. The user has a choice of any one of the eight predictors at each pixel location. If an off-the-line processing is taking place, then in principle, one could try all eight, eight predictors at each pixel location and choose the one that provides the smallest prediction error. Of course, the decoder needs to be signaled as to which of the eight predictors are used, so three bits need to be allocated to indicating, again, the choice of the predictor. Alternatively, some other heuristics can be used to make adaptive use of one of the eight predictors, and of course, one can just pick one of the eight and use it throughout the image. These predictors did not result of one specific optimization, but nevertheless, they're all reasonable predictors, and actually each, of, each one of them can be derived as a result of an optimization, as we will show next week. We show here some examples by applying JPEG LS to four different images. The results are actually out of this book, one of the standard textbooks on data compression. So there are four images, and all eight prediction modes are utilized. So here, actually, if you recall, there is no prediction. We encode the intensity values of the image directly using arithmetic coding. So one observation is that in all cases, prediction provides a benefit. So no matter which of the other seven prediction modes are used, the number of bits needed is smaller than when we are directly encoding the intensity values. What is shown in bold is the best encoding achieved in each case. And clearly, which prediction method performs best depends on the type of the image. So with this image, Sina, the fifth prediction mode gave the best performance. And we see that this is about 45% or so fewer bits than when the intensities were directly encoded using, encoded using arithmetic encoding. We also show here a comparison between the best JPEG LS and GIF, GIF, which was, if you recall, a technique to compress graphical images utilizing an implementation of a dictionary technique, and more specifically the LZW technique as I mentioned when we covered uh, dictionary techniques. We see that in all cases, JPEG LS is performing better than GIF. However, in this case, the performance is comparable. And this image is closer to, you might say, a graphical image. And therefore, this justifies the semi-equivalent performance. So we've reached the end of week eight. Two-thirds of the course is completed. Congratulations to all of you. You should all feel very good and proud about it. During this week, the first week out of three weeks dedicated to compression, we talked about lossless compression. This is an important topic on its own, but it's also very important because a lossless compression step is part of any lossy compression scheme as we'll see in the next two weeks. In addressing some of the important questions, such as how efficiently can we losslessly compress a signal, we relied on elements from information theory. We covered some of these intriguing notions and results, such as entropy and the source coding theorem. We discussed ways to generate variable length codes such as the celebrated and widely used Huffman and arithmetic codes. We'll be making use of them in the next two weeks as well. We saw how these two codes found applications in the fax standards. We also discussed dictionary techniques for encoding signals with recurring patterns, such as text. Dictionary techniques are used, for example, in the Unix compress command, in compressing signals sent over a modem, and in GIF for compressing 
uh, graphical images. Finally, we talked about the principle of prediction, which is utilized in many signal processing tasks, such as the compression task we are discussing here. In lossless compression, the prediction error is encoded without error and sent to the decoder, while in lossy compression, it is first quantized and then encoded error-free, as we'll see in the next two weeks. So we already have a good understanding of the concept of compression, and more specifically, lossless compression. All we need to do now is utilize what we've learned, but include a quantization step in the process, which is not a reversible process. Due to quantization, error will be introduced, but higher compression ratios will be achieved. And this is all we'll be doing in the next two weeks. So I hope you found the material of this week interesting. I'm looking forward to continuing with the material of the next two weeks. So I'll see you next week.